of the nature of the way. Now, uh, the translations are uh, accurate in all three, the way that it reads, because it's, it's what it's saying to us that is so significant. And uh, in whichever version you happen to be reading, uh, you'll see what it is that I'm talking about. The Lord your God is with you. The Lord your God is in the midst of thee, and he is mighty. And, uh, you know, as we look at that, there's something that has to come to mind, particularly in this time of year. As we think about the songs that we sing so often about Emmanuel, Emmanuel, and how we often in all the things that we sing and look at and talk about, we uh, we think about God being with us. And the way that He is with us and the way that He has been with us is through our Savior. Our Savior, who is spoke about in Isaiah, He shall be called Emmanuel, which is interpreted God with us. And uh, that that's a, a beautiful thing. You see, because the Lord is a very personal God. He is a very personal Savior. He is, he is your God. Now, He may be my God. He may be the God of the person that lives up the road. He may be the God of the one on the other side of the world, but it doesn't change the fact that He is your God, that He is your Savior, that He is your friend. And that is a mighty thing to think about, to be, uh, to consider. And where he dwells is so significant. There's a song that I, I really love that's out right now that, uh, that in it, uh, it, uh, it, it the, uh, the person that sang it says, well, you know, to some people, he just, uh, they just think he's in a cathedral that's made out of stone, but uh, I know that he lives in my heart. I know that it's his home. I know that's where he's at. And I know that I can be certain of that, that he dwells with me, that he is indeed Emmanuel in a truest sense of the word with each of us who have trusted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Uh, where God dwells is in the midst, in the inner part, in the depths of who we are, in our hearts, in, inside of us. And in that sense of the word, Christianity is unique in the world. It's different than anyone else. It is different than any other religion. It is different than any other kind of faith. It is indeed the mighty God Himself coming to live in your heart, to live inside of you. The Word of God makes it plain as we look in the book of Colossians and in other places where it says that Christ in you, the hope of glory, living in you, you in Christ and Christ in you. And what a beautiful picture that is of a, a picture of what we talked about this morning as, as we were talking about uh, what Jesus told them and, and you know, you're being filled with the Holy Spirit, surrounded by and, and totally inside and all around you in every sense of the word, giving you the power uh, to be able to live, uh, to overcome, to be uh, that person that he, uh, that you uh, ought to be, that He wants you to be. He is, it says, mighty to save. He, is, he will save you, it says in this verse of Scripture. He is, he is uh, uh, His very name that the angel said when the angel came and, and she spoke to him and said, Thou shalt call His name Jesus. Jesus, uh, the word, uh, the root word from that uh, comes from Joshua in the Hebrew and in the Greek Jesus and and the, the very word itself, Yasha, means uh, to save. And, that, uh, and, and that's what we're talking about here. His very name speaks of what He does, of the salvation that He gives. There is indeed plainly and simply not one that He cannot save. There is not one that He is not willing to save. There is not one that He would not touch their heart if they would reach out to Him, that if they would come to Him, if they would accept the gift that He offers, if they would uh, just trust Him, He would save them. Without any question, He would do that. He would not 
turn them away. He plainly says that he would not cast anyone out. That, uh, that he says, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. I, I will save if they trust, if they believe, if they follow. And the plain, simple fact is that when he saves, he saves completely. The Bible tells us in Hebrews that he is able to save them to the uttermost that comes to God by him. And to, to save completely, uh, to make everything right, to make that person a part of the kingdom of God, a part of the family of God. Uh, it, it's tremendous to think about it and the way that he saves. Goodness sakes, there are at least three ways that have been enumerated uh, that he saves. He saves uh, from the guilt of sin because we were guilty because every one of us has sinned. Every one of us has done wrong and yet he takes away that guilt with his blood. He saves from the power of sin because he makes us able to overcome. He says there have no temptation taken you but such as is common to man and God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted about that you're able but will with the temptation make a way of escape. He makes the way out because he is with you because he lives in you and you can be certain of it he saves completely and then and beyond that someday he will save from the presence of sin that that we talked about this morning as we as we talked about the lord's return as we talked about the time when sin will be no more as we talked about the time well we didn't mention the new heaven and the new earth but there's going to be one okay amen and the Bible uh, tells us about it, that the presence of sin will no longer be there because there won't be any sin. There won't be any wrong. There won't be any death. There won't be any of those things. And that is such a tremendous thing uh, to think about. Deliverance from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, from the presence of sin. And Christ is the one that lives within us. He will take great delight in you. He will rejoice over you with joy. His power saves us. And then he rejoices about it. And you know, when we think about that, it's a, it's a powerful thing. When we think about God rejoicing over us. His delight is shown in what he did. You see, Jesus came to this place, this central place, this place that was far removed from where he was, from heaven, from the glory he had with his Father, from the things that were there before the world was created, before any of those things, to, to this place. and. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't help but think about a movie I saw one time and somebody was sweeping up and they said, well, maybe this is heaven. He said, no, if it was heaven, there wouldn't be so much dust all around. You know, it, it wouldn't be that way. Well, I, I don't know anything about the dust, but I do know one thing, that he was willing to leave the splendor of heaven knowing his destiny and come to this place to die on a cross to save you and to save me, to shed his precious blood, and we indeed are bought with a price, the price of the mighty Son of God, the death that he died, the, uh, the blood that he shed, the gift that he gave, in every sense of the word. And think about it. The Bible plainly tells us that there is rejoicing in heaven over a soul that's saved, over one person that's saved. Whenever, when anyone trusts Jesus as Savior, they rejoice in it. And that is such a tremendous thing to consider and to think about. What a wonderful and beautiful picture that is. He will quiet you with His love. He will rest in His love. Now, you know, there's a, someone who said this, and I don't really know who it was. I didn't write the name down. wish I did. I said it this way. It said, gives me the picture of God holding us close in his arm. A picture of a mom resting her child on her shoulder. A child who knows he's done, it's, has done wrong, yet is comforted by the one who is wronged. You know, that, 
that in spite of the fact that I was disobedient, he holds me close and loves me anyway. Wow. He says in his word that it was while we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. Holding us close, loving us close in every sense of the word. What a beautiful picture of grace it is. Unmerited favor, not because I deserve it, not because any of us deserve it, but he did this for us. And, you know, when we do wrong, and we've stumbled and we fell, and when we've, when we've hurt somebody that we love in some way or another, when we have spoken an ill word, when we've done anything like that, sometimes it, we, uh, we find ourselves uh, wishing we could hide somewhere in a closet. We find ourselves uh, shaking from the fact that we did it in some kind of way or another. We, uh, we find ourselves um, uncomfortable in every kind of way. But he tells us that perfect love, his love, casts out fear. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to let it destroy us. We don't need to fear in this life. We don't need to fear death or eternity or anything on the other side. Now, there are those that when they talk about different things, especially talking about the uh, standing before the throne, uh, uh, all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and one thing or another, they make it seem like a fearful thing. And, you know, there is a scripture that says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But we belong to Him. We're His children. We are not His enemy. We are not... Uh, uh, we are not against him. We are not his foe. We are his friend. We are his family. And he calls us friend. And what a beautiful thing it is to consider that. We don't need to fear any of those things. Jesus said in Matthew 11, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly, and you shall find rest for your souls. Rest. Rest. God talks about rest. You know, uh, I listen to songs a lot. I like singing. I, I like hearing the songs. I, I'm playing the Christian songs all day long and when I'm in the car. I, I, I hear them, one right after another. And I listen to the words that it says. And... And uh, one of them says uh, something to the effect of you're always working. And, you know, and then you think about where it says, well, on the seventh day God rested. What, what does it mean when it says that God rested? Well, when it says that he rested, it says that he completed the task he was working on. It doesn't mean that God wasn't all the time holding everything together because everything's being held together by God. It doesn't mean that he wasn't involved in the lives of all the, all of the things that he had created, all the people and everything else, because he has always been involved in every kind of way. But it means that he accomplished what he meant to accomplish. Now, when we rest, it says we rest not in ourselves, but we rest in him. And so what it amounts to is this. You see, we rest in him. We rest in his labor. We rest in what he did and not what we ourselves are able to do. We can't save ourselves, but he saves us. And we want so easily, most of us, most people, they want somehow to do something to get the pleasure of God, to do something to get Him to love Him, to do something to get close to Him, to do something to earn salvation. And none of us can do it. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. That's the way it is, you see. And I rest in His labors and not my own. I rest in what He did and not what I can do. And I am resting in Him. God rested from his labor 
And we can rest in Him. And He will rejoice over you with singing. That is amazing, you see. We sing to God. We sing about God. We sing because of God. We sing as a result of what our Savior did. We love to sing. And it's okay for us to sing. But does God sing? Well, the Bible says He does. You see, this verse gives new meaning because it plainly says that God himself sings and we're made in his image. God sings. And the big thing is he sings because of us. It says he rejoices over us with singing. That he looks at you and delights in you so much that it brings a song to his heart. Wow! Think about that. That God sings because you trust him. Because you believe in Jesus. Because you became part of his family. He rejoices over you with singing. My goodness, it is such an amazing thing to think of. We are told over and over to rejoice, to praise, to sing. But here, Almighty God sings. And Luke 15, 71 I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. Now, you know, when I read that verse when I was young, I always thought about looking up and seeing 10,000 angels singing because I got saved. But I never thought about God doing it. God singing because I got saved. God singing because you got saved. What a powerful thing that is to think about, to wonder about, to, uh, to grasp in whatever way we can. Worship is a place for singing. When we come together, it's, it's good to sing. It's good to lift up our voices in song. And the truth is that worship and worship leaders are a part of God's plan for his people. Look in the Old Testament. A song to the sons of Korah. A song of David. A song. Over and over, it speaks about these things. Moses and, his, and Miriam and them and when they went out of Egypt, they sang a song. And we see over and over in places where when they built the temple, they brought together all these singers and all these musicians and all of these to lift up their voices in song, mighty to praise God for what He had done. How beautiful it is. Thank God for those who do sing and who lead singing and who give these kinds of this kind of help to those of us who need it to be able to sing and lift up our voices. But we can sing because of what he said in verse 15. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He's gotten rid of them. We don't have to fear to stand before him. We've been forgiven. Our sins have been taken away. And because of that, we ought to sing and shout. We ought to lift up our voices 
And we ought to do more than that because then what it tells us about is that we should not let our hands be idle. Because that's in the verse right before it. It says, let not thine hands be slack. He says, okay, you got something to sing about, and get busy. Okay? Sing. Be happy. Rejoice. And do the work of the Lord with joy in your heart because of what he's done for you. Father, thank you for letting us come together to sing together, to worship together, to lift up our voices. And Lord, I can't help but find it amazing that you sing. But you gave us the desire to sing and a song in our hearts and a desire to worship. Lord, I'm so glad you did. Thank you for all you do. And thank you for the song that you sang and the song that you put in our hearts. In Jesus' name.